Good morning, everyone. Today is March 11th, 2017, and this is the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society Science Chat. And uh, today we have uh, Roger Anderton, who is going to be talking to us about relativity. So I will let Roger take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thanks for letting me do this. This is um, sort of the usual thing about criticizing Einstein's relativity. And sort of from my point of view, it's got a lot of ambiguities in it. And I hope to explain why. Roger, you are difficult to hear. Difficult to hear. Do I raise my voice or something? A little quiet. If you can get closer to your microphone, that would help. Okay, I'll, I'll just raise my voice. A lot of times people complain I talk too loudly. No. Okay, I'm, I talk loud. Can you hear me? That's better. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Okay. So it's at this level, you can turn your mic down if I'm too loud. So thank you for having me, uh, allowing me to do this presentation. It's a sort of usual thing about complaining about Einstein's relativity. And I'm, I'm tackling it, of course, from my point of view. And from my point of view, there's a lot of ambiguities in Einstein's relativity. And I want to explain why I have this point of view. So I'm going to the next slide. Oh, yes. Yeah, next slide. So the title is Ambiguities in Einstein's Relativity. And my claim is Einstein's relativity is ambiguous. Einstein never wrote clearly as to what his theory or theories, because it's both general relativity and special relativity, and he never made it clear really what they meant. And added to that, he kept changing his mind. It will be impossible to deal with all of the ambiguities in Einstein's work, so I will be concentrating on the ambiguity of precisely what light speed consistency is supposed to mean. Einstein supposedly abandoned Newtonian physics. Sorry, I have to sort this phone out. Can we possibly be even louder? Can we be louder? So, uh, so, so my, I'm back again. So my wife was supposed to sort the phone out, and that's not happened. So your chaos. Sorry about that. Uh, so back to the beginning, Einstein's relativity is ambiguous. Uh, so I will be concentrating on some of that ambiguity, namely with the what is called light speed constants, constants, constancy. Uh, Einstein is supposedly abandoned Newtonian physics, but did he really do that? The constancy of light speed postulate can be interpreted in such a way that it is consistent with Newtonian physics, and we get the result that in the Lorentz equations with V equals naught, as per the sort of thing Harry Weicker has been talking about, it is, is that, that sort of the solution as to what could really be meant. Has it merely been a series of mistakes by Einstein and his followers that have? has prevented V equals zero has been recognized as the real solution to the maths that Einstein is doing. That's basically what I'll be covering. Right. Um, with the philosophers of science, uh, they say such things as this person who's a professor, uh, John D. Barrow. Einstein restored faith in the unintelligibility of science. Everyone knew that Einstein had done something important in 1905 and again in 1915, but almost no, nobody could tell you exactly what it was. When Einstein was interviewed for a Dutch newspaper in 1921, he attributed his mass appeal to the mystery of his work for the ordinary person. Does it make a silly impression on me here and yonder about my theories of which they cannot understand a word he said. I think it's funny and also interesting to observe, I'm sure, that it is a mystery of not understanding 
that appeals to them, it impresses to them, it has the colour and the appeal of the mysterious. So it's, it was widely known at the time when Einstein became famous that people were not having were having difficulty in understanding what he was talking about. Now, from my point of view, it's Einstein is writing things and it's ambiguous. So the reason why people have difficulty understanding him is because he's not writing clearly enough what he means. So the fault is with him and not with people reading him. Right. When you try, you or we try to make sense of what Einstein is talking about, it, it, it does not make sense. He is not making things explicitly clear to what he is doing and leaving a lot of things open to numerous different interpretations. For instance, in 1905, in his paper on special relativity, he says, we will raise this conjecture, a purport of which will hereafter be called the principal relativity to the status of the postulate, and also introduce another postulate, which is only apparently irreconcilable with the former, namely that light is always propagated in empty space with a definite velocity, which is independent of the state of motion of the written body. But as you read the paper, he never explicitly states what he has done to reconcile the apparently irreconcilable. So he's not really explained what he's done as far as I'm concerned. He does not say he's, whether he's, for instance, whether he's abandoned Newtonian physics or not. Many people's interpretation is that he abandoned Newtonian physics. But if that is the case, then what parts of Newtonian physics and why? He does not answer any of this. And so we could just look at what he's saying and take the opinion that he is making uh, math mistakes and should still be in the context of Newtonian physics, an issue which I'll come back to uh, on. So first thing you want to deal with is time dilation. So I was going to show uh, the usual sort of uh, uh, I was going to show the usual sort of thing for this. The, the have a time dilation equation from Einstein, and I think it's the first video where you use a light clock, which we should be coming up next. Let me put that video up then. Let's go. Let's see here. Okay, we're going to watch this video. Oops, just a second here, replay. I think I got the wrong video there. Okay, first video on the light clock. Okay, here's the video on the light clock. So go ahead and explain it. All right. Here we go. So light is bouncing between uh, mirrors and one of the light clocks is moving. So the light clock that is stationary, the light is just bouncing up and down. But the light clock that is moving has the light going at an angle, bouncing between the mirrors at an angle. And this is part of the special uh, it's part of relativity principle that if you're moving as the person is moving with the light clock, then the light should appear to bounce up and down in the mirror. But from the person who's watching you moving with that mirror, then from his perspective, the light is going at an angle. So this is illustrating the difference between uh, what a stationary observer is seeing. He's seeing his light clock with the light going up and down but the light clock that is moving, that light is going at an angle. Okay, that's that one. So it's the next video, uh, not video, it's the next website link.
to deal relative to your website length. Okay, let me put that up. I think that's this one. Roger, I still can't hear you very well here. This is Harry. Okay, sorry. I'll try to talk up. Try, try to speak louder. Okay. Yeah, I'm having trouble too. Sorry, can we, can we we'll down? let you know if you overload <laughs> or distort. Can you bring go down the video? I'll uh, leave the internet for this this the uh, website. Go down. Frankly, where do you want to go? Stop there. Stop there. Yeah. Stop there. There. Stop. 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 That's enough. So what you've got is you've got a triangle, and from this triangle, you are uh, getting these lengths. The, the hypotenuse is the length of C times delta T, and the horizontal is V times delta T. And the vertical is C times delta T prime. And so with a bit of mathematical manipulation, you then get the time dilation equation, which is boxed up down there. Uh, so that's what I wanted to show on that. So we, it was only just illustrating where this math uh, is. Roger, this, this doesn't look right to me. That, that, that thing doesn't look right. Well, I don't, this equation here that's delta T, delta T prime equals delta T divided times that, that says that delta T is less than, delta T prime is less than delta T, which means the time in the moving frame is less than time in the rest frame. Oh, well, they, they do, man, they do uh, manipulate these things around a bit, so. Well, yeah, this is kind of like my one of the issues that I have is that, you know, um, uh, you know, you got here's this equation here. This equation appears in different forms. Sometimes it's delta T equals delta T times that radical, which is Stein shows in his paper. And then sometimes it's um, delta T prime delta T divided by that. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so they, they, they do it a bit what are they talking about? So I'll, I'll just take this one. This is that's a big ambiguity right there. Yeah, I, I'm taking this one that basically to me that what they're basically saying is there's two different time intervals. There's a delta t prime and there's a delta t time intervals, and they're supposed to be different. Now, if you if you were going by Newtonian physics you wouldn't have those time intervals being different. And so the answer would be that velocity or speed V would be equal to zero. So that equation just reduces to delta T prime equals delta T. And the answer is V equals zero. So I want to go back to my slides. Is it? Okay, let's get back to your slides. Uh, can I ask, are we, um, are you say, are you moving on from accepting this idea of the uh, difference between a moving uh, bounce light and a static bounce light? Well, the, 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 the light clocks, one, one clock, light clock stationary and the mm. other light clock moving. Yes. Triangle. My, my, I have a point about this, and that is that it's absolute rubbish. Uh, the, uh, um, if something was moving and the light was bouncing, it would move out of the way of the light. There's no way that that reference frame can drag the light along. There's no way that the light will bounce at an angle once it's bouncing on a mirror uh, backwards and forwards. You imagine those two mirrors moving, it would just leave the light behind. There's no reason why the light should travel and certainly no reason why it should travel at an angle my uh, my opinion is that uh, anything that's based on the light clock has to be rubbish 
Yeah, well, well this is um, how the mainstream is setting up the maths for it. And the claim that the mainstream makes is if you've got a light clock and you're observing the light bouncing up and down, mm -hmm. vertically up and vertically down, if you suddenly move with constant velocity and the light sort of then doesn't go up and down, virtually up and down, sort of like lags behind you, you, you then know that you're moving. But by the principle of relativity, you're not supposed to be able to under, have any way of detecting whether you are stationary or moving with constant velocity. So from their perspective, the light has to then always go up and down vertically. And that's what their claim is. Yes. So, so Yeah, but it, it's an interesting point. I never yeah. thought about it that way. It's a rubbish claim, though, of course. Well, this I mean, is the claim going by the principle of relativity. For you, the light is going up and down. But if another person is watching you... No, I understand exactly uh, what everyone believes. It's just that yeah. it's uh, nonsense, isn't it? Well, this is the principle of relativity. And it, it, it goes back to Galileo. And Galileo, when they, they were represented, is you consider a ship and you ask, if you drop a ball from the top of the mast of the ship and it falls vertically down to the deck of the ship mm. if you and that's 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 what you observe when you're stationary. well roger do, are you understanding his point his point is that if you like we were showing that video that lock of that that light clock um mm. his point is that the light actually wouldn't do that that when the mirror started moving the, the light would actually just bounce out of the mirror and it wouldn't move with the mirror at all. So I've never thought about that. Well, as the, a the whole point. hypothesis is, is based on this nonsense of, you know, that light doing something the light just doesn't do ever. The source of the light is already moving. So the energy uh, of motion of the source is already imparted on the light. When no, it's, it's not. When, when, no, it's, when it's, you can't when it's impart emitted. You can't impart something to light. Once a light beam has been uh, propagated, it's completely uninfluenced by anything around it. In absolutely fact, the only agree, way you... Absolutely agreed, but the light source is already moving, and so the light source light is emitted from the moving source. You don't emit the light and then begin the source moving. They're moving no, simultaneously. No, but if you imagine that that light is bouncing backwards and forwards and it's stationary, as soon as it starts to move, it moves out of the beam of the light. The two mirrors are moved it's out of the starting, way of the light. It's, our, it's already moving. It's like if you were throwing if you were throwing a ball back and forth across to, across there. If you were to throw well, a you, ball, you could have started. Moving, you could have started stationary. No, you I mean, didn't. Obviously, well, even, well, even if you, you start can. when you're on the move, it's exactly the same. Started, you could have started stationary, but then you've introduced an object that's like you're, you have a train that's now accelerating after you emit emitted the light. That's not the way the experiment works. Okay, you imagine you're traveling. In, you imagine you're traveling in a train and you've got a torch and you've got a mirror. You give a blip into that mirror. <laughs> well, uh, the train's moved on. If it does bounce back, it's certainly not going to come back onto the same mirror. Whether you start traveling or start stationary, it will absorb. It will be absorbed by the other mirror and re-emitted by the other mirror, and it'll be re-emitted with the energy of the velocity of the mirror in addition to the velocity of the light. So it will be re-emitted. Well, you're you're saying you're saying that light is influenced by the um, by its reference by the reference frame through which it is traveling, which is not the case. Okay. Okay. Sorry. We, we'll, we'll just let it go. Anyway. So, if we go back to, uh, I don't want to show those uh, that video, the light clocks again. But this is <laughs> the, claim, Sorry. the claim. The claim from the, the mainstream is light is behaving in that way. They, they then get a Pythagorean triangle, and from the Pythagorean triangle, they do a bit of maths, and they end up with the time dilation equation. So this is what the claim is from the mainstream, and the ex relevant experiment, of course, is the Michelson-Morley experiment. So that is the claim. This is how it's understood from that experiment. So Einstein has two postulates 
and he says nothing about abandoning Newtonian physics. So if what is really meant, if this time, dilo time dilation equation is to be consistent with Newtonian physics, then it's consistent when V equals zero. Thus, what dealing with is one frame and not two. So go back to that equation, that equation just by Newtonian physics, V equals zero. And then you've got universal time. And the claim that you're dealing with two different inertial frames is false. And those frames are really just one frame. You've got a universal frame. So it's how how is this equation after you've formed it supposed to be understood? Are you supposed to still be interpreting this form Newtonian physics or not interpreting it from Newtonian physics? So it's you're pi piling on all of these different uh, problems. And Einstein is not being explicitly clear what he's doing. Uh, but apparently, he seems to abandon Newtonian physics, or he's making a mistake in a long line of other mistakes. So he's either abandoning Newtonian physics and claiming this equation has V other than zero, and maybe he's making loads of mistakes by doing this. It's just not. It's just unclear what he's doing. Well, in the in the nineteen oh five paper, he uses the word stationary frame about fifty three times. Yeah. So I've tried to point that out as as Einstein trying to declare there's a single frame that he's talking about, uh, and you just mentioned that you know there's not two frames, there's one frame, but I think Einstein mentioning the word stationary fifty three times. It's kind of a clue that he meant one. Yeah, the, the trouble with using that frame, what, is, what you're talking about is two, two inertial frames. And no, but there's only, I'm just saying that Einstein himself used the word stationary all throughout his 1905 paper, but, but which, you got, which seems to be got, ignored. <laughs> if you've got, you got two frames and one frame is moving relative to the other, and a person in either frame will claim his frame is stationary. So, uh, no, but Einstein's quite clearly says there's only one stationary frame. Yeah, but a person in each frame, a person in either frame would be claiming their frame is stationary. You so, could do that, but that is that. My claim is that's not what Einstein is talking about. He says you pick a frame, any frame, any frame will do. That is declared as the stationary frame, and all the math is done relative to that frame. Mm -hmm. So two people cannot claim to be the stationary frame. That would make no sense at all. And I, and I don't think that Einstein was meaning to say that. Well, this is the problem with trying to understand what he's saying. If, if by the principle of relativity, uh, a person doesn't know whether they're stationary or moving with constant velocity. And so, if you've got a person in one frame saying, I'm stationary, meaning he doesn't know whether he's moving with constant velocity or not, and he observes another frame which is moving with a velocity, constant velocity, then which is the stationary frame? Obviously, you are. By the principle of relativity. You just, by the principle of relativity, any one person can make that decision. And if, and if all the math is done relative to that one person, it all works out. Exactly, but then you just Newton. If you go in v equals zero, then it's just Newtonian physics, or it seems to be. But then yes, um, that's just Newtonian physics. But, then it's ambiguous. but that's my point. I mean, yeah. I was just kind of wondering. Basically, the question is, how do you how did you interpret his use of stationary fifty three times in the nineteen oh five paper? Yeah, it's, it's ambiguous. I think. And you think it's ambiguous? Okay. I, without especially stating what he is doing, this is Einstein again. It's impossible to make sense of what math mistakes he's making and what conceptual mistakes he's making. It's just an ambiguous mess. So he needs to explain his concepts properly and explain how the concepts are connected to the maths he's using. And he's not making things explicitly clear whether he's abandoning Newtonian physics or not. And well, I suppose that that is the, the point of fact, which is the is, is how to interpret that stationary frame. And that's a matter of opinion. To me, it seemed pretty clear that, you know, you can only use one stationary frame at a time. 
yeah. but see people seem to be uh for some strange reason uh desperately trying to say that they can have two stationary frames at the same time mm -hmm. which i don't believe einstein ever meant <laughs> But, but a, that's kind a, of my opinion. Franklin, but it, Franklin, Franklin, that's a minority opinion. We've discussed this several years ago. You keep saying this, and we've told you that it's wrong. Everybody in Nick, Percival, I've told you it's wrong. Tons and tons of people have told you it's wrong. Please stop saying it. Okay? Well, it could be either I'm wrong or it could be you're wrong. You're so. just putting your interpretation on what you think he said and then telling us, everybody else, that we're wrong. It's just your opinion. Yes, it's just my opinion. That's exactly what I'm and declaring. your opinion is not what the physics books say. Okay? Absolutely. So stop trying to confuse the issue. Of course, I never say anything that the physics book says, so that's not unusual for me. Correct. So, what the point is that Einstein does make mistakes and mainstream sort of accepts this to some extent. I've got another website. Well, the bottom line is, is that if what Franklin says is true, then relativity is just an ether theory. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I've read books where they, they, they think that Einstein is just talking about an ether theory, but then you've got Correct. to say he hasn't talked about it very well. doesn't make, hasn't about it in a coherent way to understand that that's what he's talking about. So you've got all these problems with Einstein as it's not very clear what he's doing. And of course, he changes his mind a lot. If you read all his papers, he's sort of like, one, one year he's saying one thing and next year he's thinking maybe it's something different. So he's not clear. So can I go to my next website link? It's five things Einstein got totally wrong. Okay, so you want to take a look at the next link? Thank you. Okay, uh, let's see here. Already falling Is... apart I don't understand what Einstein's talking about. Okay, so which link do you want to go to? Do you want to go to the We Understand General Relativity Better Than Einstein? Uh, it's, the, it's, a, it's a website called Five Things Einstein Got Totally Wrong. Okay, let's see if we can find that. Let's see, in the links that you sent me, five things Einstein got totally wrong. Okay, that's the one we want to look at here. Let me bring that up. Okay. Can we have the links in the chat box? Yeah, let me put that uh, above here. Well, it's coming up. So here's this link, and let me see. I believe I can share out the screen now. Okay, I think this is it. So. Yeah, so slowly go down it. I like each one, two, three. All right, four. let's see. Okay. So, so the first one, one is that there's a big picture of Einstein. <laughs> yeah. And we've got the top of it. So this is a big page. So this might take a, this might be slow to load. Yeah. Where is the top of this page? Okay. This is the fusion state. The equations still need the. Constant. Okay, five things that Albert Einstein got totally wrong. Okay. Okay, so there's a picture of him playing the violin. So number one, a notable error shows up in Einstein's most famous work, relativity. Because this thing's got huge pictures, it's kind of hard to scroll. It says five is biggest mistakes. So say so five is biggest mistakes, and so the other mistakes he's probably made are small mistakes. <laughs> so like the mainstream, from the mainstream point of view, they kind of have a pick at Einstein and they do alter things. And so, so that's what is highlighting what Einstein said is not 
take the thing that's complete gospel and they do alter things a bit. They look at it and say, oh, he's made a mistake here and they change things. So it is kind of theory or theories because it's general relativity and special relativity. They end up deciding what parts they think are wrong and what parts they think of it are right. And so they do end up changing things. And that leads to another uh, ambiguity you're not getting it precisely defined what Einstein's relativity is. First of all, he's changed. Einstein's probably made mistakes, both in concepts and in the maths, and he's changed his mind. And then the mainstream, when they look at him, they start deciding what parts they want to believe in. And so it is it is quite a mess, Einstein's relativity, as far as I'm, as I'm, as far as I'm concerned, from those point of views. So I think they... If we go on to the next video. So what are the five points? So the first one was the cosmological constant. The second one was something about how gravity bends light. Yeah. And, and uh, think, how gravitational think, lensing works. One of the things, he, he didn't believe in black holes, I think, one of them. And they're sort of like the mainstream now believes in black holes. And he's so, saying the third one is gravitational waves yeah gravitational wasn't that waves. just confirmed by LIGO yeah so so the mainstream is not consistent with uh, Einstein themselves because they they pick and choose what they want to believe in you go on now to my next video you I think you've got the general idea that about that next video is Chris Kennedy <clears throat> okay, here's Chris seven Kennedy's minutes, video. Seven minutes video. The first two <laughs> now, I don't know if you're going to be able to hear the audio. Oh, okay. Can you I'm hear sorry. the audio? What were we meant to take from those last pictures that just went through? Well, the mainstream, uh, the mainstream decides what part of Einstein's relativity they want to believe in. I mean, you know, Einstein says certain things. And, and they don't necessarily take that as gospel and they decide what bits they want to believe in. So they don't take them as 100% accurate. When Einstein says things that there's no black holes, they don't necessarily uh, believe that. They believe that they can have black holes. And so they interpret Einstein's relativity differently to how Einstein's talking about it. So this is a video. Hopefully we've got sound on it. <coughs> Okay, can you hear the sound? I played some clip of it. Can't hear any sound. So, so you can't hear any sound. So if you, you go on a bit to about uh, point at uh, five point zero, maybe I think you can do the slide bit of it. Well, <clears throat> this may not be good, but. Can you hear any of that? Yeah, I can hear that. Yeah. So the pitch you can really hear good. him talk. Okay, I'll let him talk then. Or whether you are skeptical of some pieces of the theory, I think it's a uh, the, the presentation is terrific. The visuals are terrific. The the, the Q and A at the end of each segment uh, is terrific. So uh, overall, it's a great way to educate. Uh, anyone on any level uh, in a very uh, simple user-friendly way on a lot of the typical concepts in relativity, like relativity of simultaneity, the length contraction, time dilation, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, the, the specific thing that I'm going to focus on for the most part is uh, the twin paradox and even uh, certainly isn't an attack on uh, uh, green uh, because, uh, you know, as you'll see, I, I would guess that the majority of the physics community mm -hmm. So there's a, a number of modules, over 40 or so modules, that I would encourage everybody to take a look at. Obviously, if you're watching, hopefully you've watched it already, uh, because if uh, you're watching a video that's a rebuttal, uh, hopefully you've actually seen uh, the course first, so that you, you know what it is that I'm, I'm rebutting. Uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, spoiler alert, uh, the traveling twin is there when he gets back. So, uh, but anyway, let's get going. Okay, you stop it.
Let's go for it now. So essentially, uh, we're going to start. Okay. Stop it. Yeah, stop it now. I'll summarize it. I'll summarize. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, it'd be a good idea to look at what Chris Kennedy is saying uh, in this video. Uh, yeah, to yourself at a personal in your own time. But basically, he is pointing out to begin with that when it comes to the solution to the twin paradox, uh, what the mainstream does is they offer lots of different solutions to the twin paradox. And that basically is the contradiction in it. If, you, if you've got a solution to the twin paradox, it should really just be one solution. And if you're offering lots of different solutions, then it is a contradiction. That is what the contradiction really is. But the mainstream don't seem to accept that. When they're given these lots of different explanations to the twin paradox, they just seem to refuse to accept that that is a contradiction and ignore it. And that's basically what the problem is with this twin paradox. It is a paradox, but the mainstream just doesn't want to recognize it as such. And then they start offering all these different uh, solutions to it. So if we go on to the uh, next one, next website, please. Okay, next website. Okay. This one. Roger. Well, he's doing this. I think we agree that if um, Franklin's interpretation, where he says Einstein didn't mean what everybody else thinks he means, then there is no twin paradox, right? Well, the, the, the thing with, with Einstein's writing is how do you interpret it? He's not making things explicitly clear. He's, when, when, what, one of the examples I use is for like when, when my wife asked me because she's pushing me to keep going for exercises now. She heard to me, "Have you gone to the gym today?" And I say, "Yes, I've gone to the gym today," but I don't tell her I haven't gone into the gym. And so when you make the statement, "I went to the gym today," the implication is that I've gone inside and done some exercises, but I haven't made that claim. All, all I've done is made the claim that I've gone to the gym. And I haven't said that I've not gone in. And so without making explicitly clear, uh, making it without with the statement, we're not making explicitly clear what happened, you're leaving things ambiguous. And that's the sort of thing what Einstein has done. Uh, he's not made it explicitly clear what he's doing. If, he, if he's abandoning Newtonian physics, He's not made that explicitly clear. If it, he is abandoning his new senior physics, senior physics, what is he replacing it by? And if he's talking about a stationary frame, and then he's talking about being there being two different frames, what what is supposed to be the stationary frame in that context? There's just so many things that are not explicitly stated by him, and you can read him, and you can interpret it different ways. Same as when I say I've not, I'm not I've been to the gym today, I leave it then open to you to misinterpret that as meaning that I've done, done exercises. And that's the same with Einstein. You read him and you can he leaves you to interpret it what way you want. He's not made it explicitly clear. It's not it's just ambiguous. <laughs> and when I when I read the Bible, I find it the same way. It, there's the things in there not explicitly clear as to what's going on and it's left to the reader to interpret it in the way that they want to interpret things and and it's well i was curious um uh in chris kennedy's video what basically did he conclude i mean did he conclude that rel that the twin paradox was the, the crux of relativity or the big one big misunderstanding well, he, he's pointing out the problem, Chris Kennedy is pointing out the problem that the mainstream gives lots of different solutions to the twin paradox, but then the mainstream does not seem to admit 
that we're giving lots of different interpretations of different paradoxes. And that's what the problem is. So is it one big misunderstanding? Well, what is the correct interpretation of the twin paradox? If you're trying to make sense from Einstein, it's left in ambiguous from my point of view. It's what is he saying? It's ambiguous. You can you are free to read him and interpret it in different ways. So that's the problem with it. He's writing as a mystic or as a poet, and he's not making things explicitly clear. If you're writing a story, a novel, then you'd like Shakespeare or anybody, you can write a story and it's left to the reader to interpret the story in the way that they like, because certain things are ambiguous. But if you're writing a physics paper and you're leaving things ambiguous, then that is bad in my point of view. And that's precisely the way Einstein's written the, his physics paper. He's written it like a poet or a mystic and he's left it ambiguous. He's left it to the reader to interpret what he's saying. And without explicitly saying what he's doing, it's, it's lots of different ways you can read him. That's what's the problem with him. It appeals so to is there, a, is there a correct way? Is there a way in which it actually makes sense? Well, the way that you would make sense with it is I would get the thumbscrews out and interrogate Einstein. But you can't do that now because he's dead. So. This is next. So if we go on to the next website slide here, it's this person. Yes, I have it up here. Is this the one you want? Yeah, it's ideology of relativity. Uh, um, he's pointing out, if I read the abstract here, in the interwar period, there was a significant school of thought that repudiated Einstein's theory of relativity on the grounds that it contained elementary inconsistencies. Some of these critics held extreme right-wing and anti-Semitic views. And this, and this has tended to discredit their technical objections to relativity as being scientifically shallow. So I think these right-wing people would be people who, who wanted things explicitly clear to them what's being said and they hate the poetic, mystic way of doing things. And Einstein was poetic, mystic. This paper investigates an alternative possibility that the critics were right, and that the success of Einstein's, relative, Einstein's theory in overcoming, overcoming them was due to its strengths as an ideology rather than as a science. And the way I interpret that is to me, he's written something which can appeal to people who like a poetic, mystical way of talking about things, where things are not precisely defined and where things are ambiguous. And I think from the political point of view, it's sort of the right wing people are the people that would want things precisely defined and the left wing people are more creative and they're poetic and they're mystic. So Einstein has appealed to the sort of those, that type of people. So he is a hero because he's written something which, which sounds creative and artistic, which is a different way of thinking about things compared to a right wing way of thinking about things. And I think that's where all the problem is. So if we can go to the next video, not next internet site, please. When, I, when science gets ugly. The dispute between Philip Leonard and Albert Einstein. Excellent asset. Uh, well, I want to point out that this is after World War One. Yeah. Okay. And Einstein was involved in, during World War I, was involved in um, 
I guess the peace movement or pacifist movement, if I'm not correct. Something like that, yeah. And I think there's a, this kind of gets involved into politics. Yeah, that, um, that's what I'm trying to point out, that the uh, physics has been dragged into politics by Einstein. It's sort of, there's a left wing way of thinking about things and right wing way of thinking about things. And for the left wing people, Einstein is a hero because it's demonstrating a creative artistic mystical poetic way of thinking about things and that's not the way that right wing people tend to think so if you want something explicitly stated to you in a precise way einstein's not doing that and so it's appealing to a certain type of thinking process and unfortunately if you are wanting to have science defined in a precise way, then that's already been speared as being uh, Nazi. The, the, when it's it was the rise of Hitler and all that. So you had a person who was Philip Leonard, who was a real top experimental physicist at his time, and he was pointing out problems with what he perceived with Einstein's relativity. And I think the way that he was thinking was in a more precise way about things, but Einstein was being more vague and ambiguous. And so that's what the whole clash was. And unfortunately, you've got, now got Einstein as the hero of the Allies in World War II, and the other way of thinking about things uh, as Hitler. So, it's it is it has been a political divide in physics because of this. It's it's okay. politics um, being intrusive. Can I make a few comments on this, um, if I might? One is that um, generally um, relativity was promoted by Max Planck, and um, I think that really um, that was really uh, beneficial to Einstein. And generally, people think that uh, <laughs> uh, before World War I, which would have been in the 1910 time frame, 1911, that the physics community had generally accepted the special theory of relativity. Of course, the general theory had not come. And I think maybe a lot of scientists didn't really, weren't really paying that much attention. And it wasn't until the general relativity um, experiments came out that was done by Eddington, I think I got that right, that um, there was a lot of publicity and a big splash in the newspapers, and then suddenly people started paying attention. Do you see what I'm saying? That, that, is, what, that is what's happened because Einstein became a public hero. The public right, and then suddenly now everybody's going, well, we need to look at this. And then that's when people go, what? Not, this happens not only in the philosophical community with Henry Bergson, but also, as you point out, with Lennard. Yeah, so I, I point out, for me, when I read Einstein, it's ambiguous and it's not explicitly stated what's going on. And so when you're trying to criticize it, it's well, the mainstream have now altered things. They've decided to interpret things in lots of different ways. And so it's it's not precisely defined. But it's defended by people who have Einstein as a hero. So if we go to the next website, it's called The Weirdness. The Weirdness. Uh, let's see here. So the next link you have says the speed of light is constant from Einstein light, or was it some other link you want? Weirdness. What? Which link are you looking for? It's called the weirdness. It's a web. It's a website called the weirdness. Uh, website called the weirdness. Weirdness something or other. Uh. 
Uh, module weird logic is what this last one is. Let's see if this is the one you want. Yeah. This one? Yeah, weird. There's something weird in it. So how weird is this? Where is it? Is it coming up? Do you want me to scroll down? I, I'm not seeing it yet at the moment. Oh, you're not? It oh. should be. But, oh, Let me reshare it. It's chopping over now, I think. Okay, let's, hear. let's try again. Should be a little working now? I'd like to make a few comments. Oh, here it is. All right. Yeah. I don't see anything just yet. There's a little UFO yeah. flying by, measuring the speed of C is yeah. the same. How weird is the invariance of the speed of light? It says question mark. Is the principle of special relativity really counterintuitive question mark? And so you've got this, I think it's a lady in a spaceship moving by and those dots are supposed to be the light two little dots of light going by. So they're, they're both these people were meeting, meeting, measuring the speed of light, and they're saying it's the same value C. It, it says, and if you go down, it says here, it depends on how one expresses it and, and to whose intuition one appeals. For example, it does seem counterintuitive that the speed of light does not depend on the motion of the observer in uh, animation. Zoe, the one with the headlights uh, of, in the spaceship, she measures. She measures uh, someone's got a lot of noise. Yeah. She measures with her headlights to see. Jasper, that's the little man. It's just gone again. So has anyone ever actually done this experiment? It wouldn't seem to be that difficult to do. Has anyone actually done it? Well, I think um, physicists like Louis Eaton pointed out that when they do um, their experiments, they only ever do it from one inertial frame. And so what you really need to do to special, test special relativity would to do it from two different inertial frames, i.e. where velocity between them was non-zero. Well, this wouldn't, this wouldn't seem to be that hard to do. I mean, just get someone in a car and have them drive in the forward direction of the light beam and have something that would measure the speed of C going in the direction of the car but, but and uh, compare it against the, the person who's standing uh, still with exactly the same equipment. Yeah, it wouldn't but, seem to be that hard to do. But the speed of the car, is very small with respect to the speed of light. So it's a problem. It doesn't matter. We have super, super accurate miniaturized atomic clocks that can do this. So I'm just asking, you know, so this, is, uh, this is something that we could actually do. Has anyone actually done it? Well, then, then you, you're adding on extra effects like where you're not actually in inertial. If you're on the Earth, the Earth is spinning around on its axis and the Space oh, I, that really doesn't matter. You can compensate you, for that. You got to compensate for all those <laughs> things, you know. Yeah, isn't the uh, one-way Sagnac effect of the GPS satellites essentially the same thing? I mean, I would predict that if you actually did this experiment, you would find that the person who is moving would measure the speed of light to be different. Okay, can we can we stop that thing moving? You can click on it and it stops it moving. Uh, let's see here. Can you stop it? Let's see. Click on it. Click on it. Right. Now, see, I'm clicking at it, and it won't stop. I think it's an animated GIF, so there's okay. no way to stop anyway, it. Anyway, the person who's not moving is called Jasper, and he he's measuring the speed of light, and he's saying it's a value C, and it's coming out from the headlights of this spaceship. So... When he's measuring the speed of light, is he sort of like taking into account 
the source is moving when he's doing the measurement or is not doing that. And you, you, you can take a, measure, take a measurement with respect to a point that is not moving. If you say that's C, okay. But if the point is moving, is he then taking that into account or not? So does Newtonian physics still apply here? They don't seem to be clear on whether the point is moving or stationary when you're measuring the speed of light. It's okay. Well, what's not clear is which clock are you using to measure this up by? That as well. What what clock are you measuring as well? But from what point is he moving, taking it from? If he's looking at this lady moving, he's saying, right, the speed of light relative to that lady is C. Is he saying that? And, and then he's saying, well, the lady is moving with velocity V to the right as well. And so the speed relative to a point that isn't moving would be C plus V, and that would be greater than C. No, I don't, I don't think it would have anything to do with that. It's like, like shown in the picture here, you're, the width of your, of your measuring thing is, is a certain width, like one foot. And all you're measuring is the time it takes for the light to travel one foot in your measuring device. And that doesn't matter whose velocity you're talking about. All you need is a clock and a way to measure how long it takes for that light to travel that foot from one side of the measuring device to the other. And then that reveals your speed of light, you know, regardless of any frame of reference, right? No, I, I don't say it that way because what, you, what you've got is with Zoe moving here, the lady in the spaceship, that is a moving point. Those, those points are moving. So if you're measuring the speed of light relative to a moving point, it's not going to be the same as uh, moving the speed of light relative to a point that's not moving. So this, this person, Jasper, who's measuring the speed of light uh, relative to a point that is not moving in his frame, it, that's going to be that's going to be C. It's probably going to be C. And then if he's looking at a point that's moving with a velocity which is non-zero, is he then assigning that C to that point or not? Is it different? Uh, yeah. So I we would it. predict we we would predict that the person moving would measure the speed of light being less than C. And I would predict that if you actually did this experiment exactly as shown in this diagram, that is the result you would get. Well, I, I don't think Einstein is clear. Which would that. contradict Einstein. <laughs> I, I that think, would contradict. I, I don't think Einstein is clear what he's saying when he says the speed of light is constant. If we, if we can stroll down. Let me stroll down this side. Oh. Move down. What else? Yeah. Can we Further stop? down? We done it just a bit Further more. beyond the other oh, UFOs. Oh, right, right. We stop quickly. Uh, uh, right, and if you look down at the sentence, it goes at. Oh, you moving by it now. Uh, can you come back up again? It's the, sen the sentence that starts at at. At at the stage. Go back to it. Yeah, we got it. At this stage, many of my students say things like the invariance of the speed of light among observers is impossible, or I can't understand it. Well, it's not impossible. It's even more than possible. It is true. This is something that has been extensively measured, and many refinements to the Nicholson and Morley experiment and complementary experiments have confirmed this invariance to very great precision. As to the understanding it, there isn't much to understand, however surprising and weird it may be, it is the case. Uh, it's the law in our universe. The fact of the invariance of C doesn't take much understanding. What requires understanding are its consequences and how it can be integrated into what we already know. So the way it's explained to, this is written by a professor and he teaches it to students and he's accepting that the students start, start protesting when it's told to them about the speed of light being constant. It sort of like doesn't make sense. 
Well, this gets back to my point, which is that's an experiment like shown in the diagram we can actually do. The Michelson-Morley experiment is not any kind of experiment like that at all. And that unless that professor can actually show me an experiment set up exactly the same way as that diagram, then I'd say that he is lying, that there is no such experiment. Oh, you know, this is his play. It, is, so like, it, it pushes it on to the professor. It's making a false claim about experiments. That, that, that kind yes, of he's making a false claim about experiments. Yeah, and, and the, the, the students is protesting that it's not making much sense. And if you go back, if you, if I go back to my thing about what Professor Barrow was saying, he was admitting about the unintelligibility of Einstein's relativity. And so it all ties them to that. So when the students are being faced with it, the intelligent ones realise this is unintelligible, what's being told them. And this is the issue. With, with these spaceships, Jasper and Zoe, uh, was Jas Zoe is in the spaceship and Jasper is watching. Is it obeying Newtonian physics or not? The observations made by Jasper, is it what he's seeing obeying Newtonian physics? And if he's obeying Newtonian physics, then it's not, not happening in the way the professor is describing things. And so he's misrepresenting what's been, what's really going on. And so it's a whole problem of comprehension. So can, can you go back to my slides? Come All right, back. let's go back to your slides. Thank you. Slides. Okay, here we go. Thank you. So Einstein's not being explicit about what he's saying. And we're done with these. And this is the quote I take from him. This is what we just quoted. At this stage, many of my students say things like the events of speed of light among the service is impossible, etc. So consider a situation where you have person one in frame one, person two in frame two, and the observ observations are then the following. Person one can be assigning measurements relative to frame one or to frame two. And person two can be assigning measurements relative to frame one or to frame two. Uh, so this, this reduces to person one is observing light speed relative to frame one, person two observing light, light speed relative to frame two, and person one observing light speed relative to frame two person two observing light speed relative to frame one. And, and the question is, does person one agree with the same values of what person two observes? Can, we can deal with this sort of question in the context of Newtonian physics, but can we deal with it in Einstein's relativity? So you've got, I'm talking about here, four different observations and I think those four different observations are being muddled. If abandoning Newtonian physics, we need Should to I be getting a picture here? It is on my slides now. Sorry. I don't have anything on my screen. You don't have anything on your screen? You should have this presentation on the screen. Mm, no, I don't have it. No. No. I have a slides on mine. I can see the slide. Oh. Yeah. Well, maybe you're, it's being covered up by all the people or something. Um, I've, strangely enough, I've only got an image of me. I'll fiddle around, see if I can find it. Okay. Yeah, right. maybe if you stop sharing your camera, maybe that'll be, make some room for its, the presentation or something. I'm not quite sure what the problem is. What, he's on camera, is he, that person? I'm not on okay. Camera. Hmm. Right. If we go back, so what I'm claiming is there's four observations happening uh, with person one and person two, and they're going to make claims of the light speed relative to frame one and to frame two, and I don't think that is explicitly covered 
than what Einstein's talking about. So when you read Einstein, you can uh, be interpreted in different ways. This boils down to if Einstein is abandoning Newtonian physics, we need to be told what theory is being replaced by. Einstein does not say if he's abandoning Newtonian physics and does not say what theories he's replacing it by. Therefore, Einstein leaves it all unclear what he's doing. If the four observations are the same value of C, then the most sensible solution is that the relative velocity V between the two frames is V equals zero, so that frame one and frame two are already the same frame. So that is the whole point. You're back to Newtonian physics again. If Einstein is uh, making these claim about the time dilation equation and all that, and you've got two different frames, does it all just boil down to V equals zero? Really, you've got one frame. So, faced with the ambiguity of what Einstein is talking about when he assumes light to speak constancy, if he does not mean that the four observations have the same value of C and that V equals zero, then, it, then it's unclear what he's talking about. More detail. With person one in frame one and person two in frame two, person one can assign measurements relative to frame one or to frame two. If he measures light speed relative to frame one and measures light measures speed as two, then what does person one assign as light speed relative to frame two? In Newtonian physics, this calculation can be done. You can do it by Newtonian physics, but is Einstein doing it by Newtonian physics? What does person one in frame one say of the light speed in frame two if saying it is C in frame one? What does person two in frame two say of light speed in frame one if says light speed is C in frame two? It is in ambiguous in special relativity if Newtonian physics is being used to this bit. Are the observers, are the persons expecting things to <coughs> physics? And then it's a mere bit of math to fudge with transformation, set what with different light speed to be the same in both frames. When the equations of special relativity are set up, they are derived from Newtonian physics. To go back to the uh, Pythagorean triangle from which they got the time dilation from, then that is starts off as basically um, the same sort of maths you use in Newtonian physics. And all else, if the intentions were that they are to be derived, not derived from Newtonian physics, is not stated. So it is not clear what Einstein is doing. It's all just one big mess. And I'm going to miss out that video. Oh, if we got, did I, did I send you the link for this one? Okay, we understand general relativity better than. Let me get to that. that one. I think we got you sent it. The last one, if we got the last one. Okay, let me share yeah, this. The last one. The last one. Moment. Is that, is that the special relativity crash course and go to the staff general relativity? So what, what is the point you want to make about this video? Oh, this is uh, David Gross, who's, uh, I think, won a Nobel Prize. And he's an expert on Einstein's relativity. And what he claims is that he understands Einstein's relativity better than Einstein does. And I think it's people like him, they, they're claiming um, better than Einstein. And so what they've basically done is they've revised 
relativity into a way that they suppose can understand it. So all this ambiguity on Einstein's relativity and they've got their own way of looking at it. Okay, go back to my slides please. So, so the conclusion is they're just bodging things. It's all just a big bodge. It's nothing's explained properly as to what they're doing, and they end up interpreting things in whatever way they want to interpret them. And then they tell us how clever they are. That's the conclusion. All right. Thank you, Roger. So I guess we can open things up for questions. We've got uh, okay. 45 minutes for questions. Who would like to go first? Um, maybe should, can I have a go? Go ahead. Uh, so I'm asking Roger whether he has uh, his own opinion, apart from that uh, things are being bodged, his own opinion about the various uh, things like the speed of light himself, whether he believes uh, the speed of light is constant or not, for example. Yeah, the speed of light, you, you can, the claim that the speed of light is constant, this is i.e. in vacuum, I should have mentioned before, uh, is a constant, can be treated in the context of Newtonian physics. And so, the most easiest way of dealing with it would be to treat it in the context of Newtonian physics. And if you're not doing, dealing with it by Newtonian physics, then I would like things explicitly explain what you're dealing with it in the context of. By, by Einstein, he seems to go with things like time dilation, and which might be better described as clocks, just clock rates are different. But So why is he doing that? Because what is the reason for changing to something like that? He doesn't seem to go into answers for that. I mean, why why are you doing that from Newtonian physics? If you've got clocks going at different rates, then you would adjust those clocks to go at the same rate. You would take some sort of frame as to be the standard from which to put clocks by. So no nothing which Einstein does seems to make any sense. He's not explicitly stated what he's doing. And that leaves it all open to different possible interpretations. You can look at the concepts he's talking about and say, well, he's got he's got messed up the concepts, or you can look at the maths and say, well, he's messed up the maths. And, and it, it's just it's just unclear what he's doing. What is supposed to be the difference between what he's doing and what Newton did? It's not explicitly stated. No, I hear you're saying that, yes. So I just go back to Newtonian physics. Well, I think, well, it's for, so far as the statement, the speed of light is constant. Um, I think it's actually more important that the first statement, which is that the speed of light is independent of the velocity of the emitter. I think people lose that part, that the speed of light is independent of the velocity of the emitter. Yeah, but the, then you've got the problem of the observer. Is the observer moving with the velocity of the emitter or is he stationary with respect to the emitter? I mean, sort of that is not explicitly stated. Well, I mean, this is not mysterious in the case of sound waves. So for example, when you have a moving train, it honks its horn, the speed of sound travels as a constant, uh, regardless of the speed of the train. Yeah. But, so this but is not, not a mystery. <laughs> Yeah, but Einstein is not explicitly stating whether he's treating light the same way as sound. It's, it's so if you if he were to do that, then perhaps that would have been a, a, a clearer way for him to do that. But yeah, if he would have just that. if he would have just pointed that out, so like, oh, it's the same thing as sound, yeah, and um, <laughs> and so the speed of sound is constant. It doesn't rely on the um, velocity of the emitter. 
but what it's constant with respect to is the air. Yeah, but that's that if you're bringing in a medium and Einstein brings in these other things like the medium light, which is called the ether. Well, sometimes he's discarding it and other times he's talking about there is a certain type of ether. And so it all becomes unclear what does he mean? Does he Is he talking about an ether theory eventually in his later life or not? It's just... It's just ambiguous who always changes his mind. Well, as Harry said, you know, it's like if if it was an ether theory, then then I think it's correct as it was written, right? So, but I think that some of the points of the uh, of the websites you're bringing up is that you know some people think they know better than Einstein, and they're making up uh, completely different things. Then Einstein said, you know, the, the biggest thing I have is that in all these definitions of the postulate, they always see, they always say that uh, all of the all of the frames are equivalent. But if you read the German uh, translation from Einstein, he says no such thing. He says it's constant with respect to the stationary frame. So this is something where it's like Einstein is not being ambiguous, but people are putting words in his mouth. Well, it, I think uh, this is more the more the case that people are putting words into Einstein's mouth. I, I, I think it surely should be pointed out to him that what he's saying doesn't is not clear when it's translated into English. He had plenty of time to cover that sort of issue. Well, yeah. I, I have issue with that. I mean, I'd say that what Einstein was saying was actually pretty clear and that it takes a pretty serious corruption uh, in order to get the mainstream interpretation. Yeah, the, the, that, that would be my claim. Yeah, so you've got the mainstream interpretation and then you've got your interpretation and say other people got their interpretation. And it's huge. I would blame. say if you took a fifth grader and you had him read the 1905 paper and you had them explain what Einstein meant, I would say. 99% of the times, you would not get the mainstream interpretation. <laughs> You'd have to go pretty far afield to get the mainstream interpretation. Exactly. So if you read Einstein in the original, then you're thinking, well, how the mainstream is how they interpreted it is not the way that Einstein meant it to be understood. But then he had, Einstein has not made things explicitly clear in his writings as to what's supposed to be meant. He's not saying well, you No, I would say he made it very clear, but that uh, people are just corrupting what he's saying. But that's my opinion. I mean, it seems pretty clear to me. If, if I can, can I join in on this? I just, uh, there, I think he does generally make things very clear. I think there are one or two exceptions, and one that I would offer would be uh, where gravitational time dilation uh, conflicts with um, time dilation from. Uh, the moving observer. I mean, if you've got a space graph that's far from a gravitational mass, we agree, or we say, or Einstein says, the time on its clock will be behind that of Earth. But if that graph were to descend into a low orbit, at a particular finite time, this graph might sun must suddenly fall under the influence of redshifted time dilation by uh, on impact of Earth's gravity. And that would demand that the time would be ahead of uh, Earth's proper time. So the conflict, conflict is that at that instance, the craft's clock will have suddenly to unite with the Earth's clock. And um, you've got one that's behind suddenly being with one that's uh, ahead. Uh, I can't personally understand how he would explain where the clocks would, uh, what, they, what they would read at that moment. That does seem to be something that was never um, gone into in sufficient depth. Uh, in, a, in a case of what, Einstein was talking about, or what even Franklin brought up earlier, he was choosing sound as an example, and sound is not really necessarily a good example for light, but in the same sense that uh, sound is is uh, dependent on the properties of the air that it's being transmitted in, uh, you get a constant speed. However, now I'm going to transmit it in one atmospheric pressure into a region that has a different atmospheric pressure and what is going to happen to that sound wave and what is going to happen to the speed of sound, what's going to happen to the length of sound. If I'm going into a higher atmospheric pressure, 
the speed of that sound is actually going to increase. If by if I have a clock that is actually a clock that's a like a resonant cavity, audio a sound cavity. If I ha have that cavity resonant in a low atmospheric pressure versus having that cavity resonant in a higher atmospheric pressure, the cavity is going to resonate at a higher atmospheric pressure at a higher rate of oscillations than at a lower atmospheric pressure. So as the speed of sound increases in higher atmospheric pressure, so does the resonant frequency of that hot, uh, the cavity form clock. That's about as close as you can come to how gravity behaves with light without, you know, actually, because uh, sound actually can ex exceed the, the speed of the light. I mean, light can exceed the speed of sound because of the medium that the light is traveling. And sound cannot travel faster than the speed of the medium it's traveling in because it's a particular characteristic. So anyway, yes. that's, that's, that's my interpretation of how light and, you know. Well, I would say against again, that. It's, it's an interpretation you're... of it. Yeah, but in your example, you it's moving from uh, one density to another density, whereas of course a, cr a craft that's um, coming under the redshifted time dilation is at the same position uh, above the Earth um, as the effect it should already be having of um, its clock being behind. So uh, there's no, uh, even if there was such a thing as the ether, there's nothing that would uh, affect the time well difference. you're going from a, you're going from one gravitational intensity uh, intensity to another as you move closer to the earth you're going to a higher yeah. gravitational <clears throat> force yeah. so you are in fact changing the characteristics of the gravitation which is changing the characteristics of the media that the light is traveling in <clears throat> yeah it's so, just if, if i've been traveling in a spaceship for some months and um, my uh, i'm much younger i'm far my clock is behind that of Earth. Then, as I come in to land on Earth, suddenly my clock is going to whistle <coughs> ahead, uh, and uh, that doesn't seem to work for me. Well, you're going into a higher atmosphere, it's equivalent to sound moving into a higher atmospheric pressure, or sound actually uh, going from the high altitude to a low altitude, which automatically means that it's going from a lower atmospheric pressure to a higher atmospheric pressure. I'm not saying that light is equivalent to sound because light is basically based on gravitational intensity, not uh, air pressure intensity. But uh, sound doesn't offer up uh, any complex thoughts uh, about how it would affect um, the dilation of time. Well, sound is also like it's, it's only a partial example because sound is also a compressional or longitudinal wave and light is a transverse wave. So they okay. travel to, they travel at different speeds in different in the same medium. Even hmm. uh, a longitudinal wave and a transverse wave will travel at different speeds in the same medium. Mm -hmm. Well, if you were to perform the uh, time dilation experiment with sound, you would find that the speed of sound does measure to be different. Um, but I think this is primarily because, in the case of relativity, when if you bring the clock along with you while you're moving, your clock will become slower. I mean, this is one of the tricks of uh, the experimental evidence for relativity, which is that if you are using a clock which you are bringing along with you and you compare it against a clock that is still, I mean, that's not a fair comparison. That's like taking two stopwatches, one that's run faster and one that runs slower, and then determining the race by using both stopwatches. I mean, that's not fair. When you're doing a race, you need to compare both runners against the same clock, not two different clocks. So the experimental evidence can be said to, to say that the measured speed of light is the same, but that's only because you're using a clock that slows down. Because this is kind of a slippery slope, it's either um, when you're measuring the speed of light, you need two things. You need a length and you need a timing measurement. So this is the way that they get around. They say either the length shortens or the clock slows down in order to get the same speed of light measured out in, your, in the equipment proper. Yeah, but in the case of sound, you can't make the length shorten. Your, 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 your measuring rod stays the same in the case of light. 
the actual media, the actual measuring rod changes length as you change as you change your uh, gravitational strength. So you're not only changing your rate of of oscillation of the clock, but you're also changing the length of the measuring rod due to contraction or expansion due to being in or out of a heavy, strong gravitational force. Well, the effect of gravity is constant in most cases. So uh, that wouldn't have any effect. Uh, but there well, is this controversy over whether length contraction actually happens. Uh, if, if, you're up, if you're up in a higher, higher altitude, then the uh, atoms are going to not going to expand and move away from each other because they're not being compressed as strongly as they are by a low altitude where they're being compressed into a shorter length due to higher strength gravitational field. Yes, yeah, so we understand that's, that's how different. that works. So, that's so, a different. So, that's, so that, there is a length contraction due but to that's gravitational not, that's force. Not that. relevant, that's not relevant to the time clock experiments. No, but you, why not? Because you, you were talking about time clocks because being we're, different. We're, we're not well, we're length, not moving. In this, we're not changing gravitational potential. In then, this you're not, then you're not changing anything as far as speed, speed of light goes either. It's staying the same also, because you're not changing the gravitational strength. In the same gravitational strength, the speed of light is going to be the same. But the uh, well, length I contraction would... that's associated with time dilation is to do with how things. Uh, it is accepted that things uh, get shrunk in the direction of travel as uh, the speed of light is approached. I mean, I personally don't believe this, but that is current thinking. And yeah. that's not to do with just compression of uh, atoms at uh, different atmospheric pressures. No, it's, it's compression of the, wa of the waves that make up the media, but that's make up the atom itself. So can what can relativity make sense? Uh, this is my question, is that if there's three different interpretations, A, B, and C, or D, or as many as there are people, is there a proper interpretation that fits the experimental facts? Well, can I say on this? And so what is it? I, so so I, I can say on this, when, when, when I was taught Einstein's relativity, at a degree level and all that sort of thing. Uh, they didn't go into the difficulties with it. They didn't point out to anybody uh, protesting about it. And you, you, you sit in there and when, when you say, well, that thing's not clear, you, you're able to interpret it in a way that then makes sense. And so I'm able to look at Einstein's relativity in the way I want to look at it. And it can make sense. But it's not necessarily the same way as other people are looking at it. And from my point of view, the problem with it is it's ambiguous and it's open to lots of different interpretations. And so that's what's wrong with it, basically. I can look at it and make sense to me personally. And other people I think yeah. look at it, it makes sense to them personally, but they don't. And they're not believing in the same theory. They're all believing in different theories. They're calling it Einstein's relativity, but they're still calling it different theories. I think that's part, part, probably just partial. So you, you need kind of like you can interpret it from an ether theory sort of thing, but it, it, when it's taught to you, you're saying they're saying it's not an ether theory. So you're then assuming to yourself, well, the professor's teaching that's got it wrong. Well, that sort of thing. It's, it's just not precisely defined as what it should be. Yeah, I think I think that's what you're saying, Roger, too, is probably uh, realistic in it. It was clear in Einstein's mind based on how Einstein interpreted things. And, and but we uh, only can relate to experiences we've had in a lifetime and everything we learn, basically, we try to relate to our own personal experiences. So since each of us is has experienced uh, the world and interacted with the world in different ways, we are left alone to try to reinterpret what Einstein has said in concepts that have become familiar to us. And, right. and that, that's where the ambiguity, as you says, lies, is it not necessarily so much in uh, what Einstein had to say, because he, he understood what he was saying, but for us to interpret what he's saying, we would have to be able to understand everything about how he 
uh, came to those conclusions, and that, that's not the same path we all take. He was changing his mind. He, he, he changed his mind on things. He seemed to... uh, no, I, in I some think sense, other all, people change his mind. In yeah. some sense, we all change.
in our mind as we develop our theories, as we try to explain them maybe in different ways to people as we under, as we become aware of uh, how other people might view the world, we try to make an effort to explain it in terminology that might be more familiar to them. So he may have sometimes said, looked like he was changing his mind and he may actually may have changed his mind because uh, we all have to develop our, our uh, theories. But the thing is that, you know, you're also making an effort to try to explain things in an effort, in a way that other people will understand them. So as you become aware of the way they view them, view the world, you may try to re-explain something that you've already explained in another way, uh, utilizing the uh, knowledge or the, of uh, understanding the environment that they understand, uh, like uh, like we interpret I... light as sound. Well, light isn't sound, but we compare it to that sound because uh, a lot of us are familiar with that, and we're not familiar with light because we don't touch light in the same way we touch sound. So it, it, it is a lot. It is a Everything, every theory is going to have some bang ambiguity to it to all of us because of our own personal experiences and how we interpret the world. Well, I think if you're going to say that Einstein changes his mind, then I think you have to come up with specific examples. Because it's, it's just funny to me that in all these relativity debates, no one actually quotes what Einstein says. Well, is that right? One, so, one example is. 1905 in the paper he seems to be discarding ether and in 19 no he doesn't uh well prove it quote something in 1905 well, that says, says <coughs> the, the the word ether does not appear in this entire paper so how could he be is, if i go back to i got a quote on him it's, 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 yeah so quote i have his paper uh, the introduction of a luminescent ether will prove to be superfluous uh, in as much either. So, so he's saying that the ether is superfluous in 1905. That's a quote. From in, in so much as making calculations. So, that, so he's, he's making that claim. And then 